Okay, so here we go. I need a little bit more space. So here we go. So I'm going to now expand this a little bit. Um, so uh, let's see. Both of these terms have a gamma squared in them. They both have an m in them. So I can write this now. I can pull out the m's and the gamma squareds. So it's m gamma squared. And then it's going to be c squared minus v squared. This is a c squared here, and there's a v squared there. Now, you should immediately see now that we're done. It might not be completely obvious to you, but remember, gamma is 1 over 1 minus beta squared, all square rooted. So, so I'm going to write everything in terms of betas now in this term. So this will become m. This gamma squared now becomes a 1 over 1 minus beta squared. And now I want to write this in terms of betas, too, so I'm going to divide by c squared. So this will become a 1. This, if I divide both things by c squared, it'll become a 1 here. I'm going to multiply and divide by c squared. So I'll put a c squared here, multiply in by c squared, and now I'm going to divide everything by c squared. This divided by c squared is 1. This divided by c squared is beta squared. Nice. That kills that, and it's m c squared. Oops. I've made some kind of mistake. Oh no, that's correct. The only thing that I've done wrong is this m should be an m squared, this m should be an m squared, and this should be m squared c squared. Can you? This is great. I'm going to now put a bunch of video uh, onto the web with me making mistakes in physics calculations. Luckily I have tenure. Okay, so uh, now we're going to um, now we're going to like assemble everything and just see what it means. You can see we've got something really really big here because we we uh, we did this. We put in these postulates for E and P. We assumed this thing was invariant. We checked it, and sure enough, this thing we got at the end involves nothing about the speed. It contains only the mass and the speed of light. It doesn't contain the speed of the object. So this really is plausibly an invariant. It's something that doesn't depend on the speed of the object. So we've combined two things that do depend on the speed of the object. They depend differently on the speed of the object. We've combined them, and it produced something that doesn't depend on the speed of the object. It created an invariant, which is this frame-independent quantity related to the momentum. Okay, so let's just uh, do a little more simplification, which will help us. I'm going to erase a little bit on the board. I'm going to move this part down to here, right? So just to make myself some space. This is our final answer. So to make some space, I'm going to write down here e squared over c squared. That was this thing, minus the magnitude of the three momentum squared is m squared c squared. And now I'm going to manipulate this a little bit more, and I'm going to turn it into the most important equation in all of physics. Here we go. So I'm going to multiply through by c squared. So I'm going to multiply through by c squared. This becomes a p squared c squared. This becomes an m squared c to the fourth. And then I'm going to move it to the other side. And here's the equation. e squared equals m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. Gaze upon the beauty of that expression. You're not seeing it? This is the most important equation in all of physics. It's usually written in a colloquial form as E equals mc squared, right? If I take the square root of this, well, there's this pesky momentum term. But imagine I have an object that has no momentum. Imagine I have an object that is at rest, like this marker. If I hold this marker at rest, its momentum is 0. And then this becomes E squared equals m squared c to the fourth. I can take the square root of that expression, and you would say E equals mc squared. 
the most important equation in all of physics. Now, uh, once when I was a graduate student, it's my duty to report this, once when I was a graduate student, I hope I haven't told you this story before, but if I have told you this story before, suck it up. Once when I was a graduate student, we were in Pasadena, Caltech, we were into science and all that stuff, as you can imagine. You can imagine what we looked like and how we dressed and how we walked and so on. And we all were penniless, so we're walking from Caltech campus to downtown Pasadena to go to a movie. And there's a big group of us, and we're all walking down the street. And this car of teenagers drives by. So we're in our 20s, we're all grad students. This car of teenagers drives by. And uh, one of the teenagers leans out the back window and says, Hey, nerds, E equals MC squared. And I, being a somewhat self-conscious nerd, thought to myself, how did those guys know that we were nerds? But one of my friends just jumped out of the pack and ran down the street after the car shouting, only in the rest frame, only in the rest frame. And uh, I was impressed because uh, he clearly was thinking about the physics, the important thing about what the students had said, or about the high school students had said, and not the unimportant thing, which is that we were nerds. Uh, but more impressively, he was thinking about the true meaning of E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared is the specification of this equation to the case in which the momentum is zero, which is the rest frame. So if you have a particle and you're observing it in its own rest frame, its energy is mc squared. If it's moving, its energy is larger than mc squared. It gets, <coughs> it gets this momentum component added in quadrature to the rest mass component. And as we saw uh, last class, was it? Yeah, last class, I showed that this expression for energy we've been using, that it's gamma mc squared, this expression that, that the energy is gamma mc squared, is an assumption, uh, is consistent with our expression one half mv squared. Because at low speeds, at low speeds, the expression gamma mc squared expands in the Taylor expansion to mc squared equals mc squared plus one half mv squared. That's what we showed last class. So that kind of justifies that these expressions. So let me come back to this postulate question. So we postulated a bunch of stuff, and we came up with this very important formula. This very important formula you can just see is just a product of our postulates. But our postulates are not insane. The postulates are not insane. Why not? Because these momentum components are momentum components that reduce to uh, the classical non-relativistic momentum at low speeds. And this energy expression we're using reduces to the low speed energy expressions we've been using successfully in non-relativistic mechanics. So, so these expressions, though they're a little odd, they are clearly, they have the right low speed limits, and they combine the invariant you would create out of them if you postulate that these are the components of a four vector, the invariant you create out of them is in fact something that looks like it should be an invariant, something that doesn't depend on the speed of the reference frame. So this is a very suggestive argument. Eventually, we'll learn more about it uh, when we can. Uh, but, uh, but right now, we're going to take this expression as God-given. We're going to take this definition of a four vector as God-given with these definitions of the components as God-given. And we're going to try and do some physics and see if we can conclude some things. And I think we're going to be able to do a number of problems and find some non-trivial results. In particular, inelastic collisions are going to look pretty cool in, the, uh, in this new formalism. Okay, good.